Well, hey, church, we're so glad to um, once again be back with you. Uh, I know we took uh, quite a bit of a break um, over the last couple weeks, um, but uh, with that time, we've reflected and we've just prayed and we, we've hoped and just, you know, waited for the next opportunity for us to be together again for worship. And finally, God has blessed us and God has told us this is the time. And uh, here we are, we're back, and I hope you are all doing well. And I just invite you right now to just wherever you are to stand up um, and just go and come into the presence of God and just prepare your hearts for worship.
speaks to us this afternoon, God. May our hearts be open to receive you. May our ears be open to listen to you, God, so that we can continue to sing and continue to praise you for what you have done and what you're going to continue to do, God. We give these few moments to you, and I pray everything in your precious and your holy name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. Well, church, it is great to be with you all virtually in the house of the Lord this afternoon. And it's good to be back preaching to you once again. And as I start off this afternoon, I want to start off with this simple question. When you think of something toxic, what comes to your mind? Let me say that question one more time. When you think or when you hear of something toxic, what comes to your mind? A few examples being here. Maybe it's a bad friendship or in a bad relationship that we're in. Maybe we're playing a video game online, you're reading through the chat, or you're hearing what's going on, and people just spur out words that are so negative to the point where you can't think of it anymore. Maybe someone lied to you before, or maybe someone stole something so valuable, so precious from you. There's so many things that I can list that's so toxic, that's so negative. And when it comes to the concept of toxicity, the simple definition of it is this, is that toxic is something that is negative and harmful. I'm gonna say that one more time, is that toxic is something that is negative and harmful. The reality is this. We all have something in common that is toxic, and that thing is sin. You may be asking this afternoon, what is sin? Sin, in its simple definition, is us, humans, disobeying God's command. When we think of the word toxic, do we consider the following things from the way that we dress, the way that we speak, or the ways that we act? Maybe you're listening this afternoon, and with all the examples that I'm expressing so far, you feel a little bit exposed. But let me take it one step further, if I may. Have there been moments when you've done something horribly wrong to the point where you didn't want to admit it. Maybe you've killed a loved one, physically killed a loved one. You stole something from a store to the point where it breaks out on the news. Maybe you've raged, raged so hard to the point you cannot control it. Or lied, lied to the point where you just want things to go your own way. Have there been moments when we wanted to admit something that we've done wrong, yet we didn't have that courage, we didn't have that boldness because of feeling that exposure? The Bible makes it so clear in Romans 3.23, saying that for all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. For all have sinned and have fallen short of God the glory of God. We're all messed up individuals as we're all toxic with sin. And we don't want to admit the faults that we've done because of that exposure. Why? Why is it so hard? Why is it so hard for us to admit? We feel ashamed. We feel that we need to be perfect. We feel 
that we need to be qualified under certain qualifications. And in the Bible, there's one story in the Old Testament that expresses a severe level of toxicity. In 2 Samuel chapter 11, David was living with sins that were unconfessed. And I encourage you, if you have your Bibles, to turn with me to 2 Samuel chapter 11. Again, it is 2 Samuel chapter 11. The Word of God says this. In the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Reba. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of his palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out more about her. The man said, she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent the messengers to go out to her. She came to him, and he slept with her. Now, she was purifying herself from her monthly uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, and I quote, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite, and Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the palace, with all the master servants, and did not go down to his house. David was told, Uriah did not go home. So he asked Uriah, haven't you come for the military campaign? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, the ark and Israel and Judah are staying in the tents, and my commander Joab and my Lord's men are camped in the open country. How could I go to my house and eat and drink and make love to my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on the mat along with his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it to Uriah. In it, he wrote this, put Uriah on the front where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so he was struck down and die. So while Joab was, had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army had fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite had died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, when you finish giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up and he may ask you this question. Why did you get close to the city and fight? Didn't you know they would shoot you, shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech and son of Jerubbeshesh? Didn't a woman drop an upper millstone from the wall so that he died in Thebes. 
why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you, then say to him, and I quote, Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger sent out, and when he arrived, he told Joab everything that he had said to him. To say, the messenger said to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot us at the servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. Then David told the messengers, Say this to Joab, don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack on the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. I'm going to say that sentence one more time. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord. Now there's so much to unpack in this chapter. David should have been battling with his men. But he was at the palace instead. From his palace, he could easily overlook the city, see the tops, and see what was going on. Being that Uriah, who was Bathsheba's husband, was part of David's army, he lived close to that palace. Now one day, David was walking, and he saw Bathsheba bathing at her rooftop, as this was routine at the time. Now, David could just ignore it and just see what was going on at the war, but he couldn't ignore it. He had his servants hauled her to the palace. He ended up sleeping with her. He did sin after sin, lie after lie, to get what he wanted. And David's goal was to ensure Uriah's death was at the battlefield. One sin after another sin. One sin led to the next. And David thought that he could get his ways. But in the end, what he did, getting another person's wife, moreover, getting someone dead to get what he wanted, it ended up haunting him. Now, we're laying it back to us. Have there been moments when we've wanted to cover up something? We wanted something so bad, but it came to the point where we had to lie. We had to strategically plan out something in order to get what we want. Have there been moments when we had a goal set in mind? And the only way to achieve it is to lie, is to do something, to kill, to plot against someone, to get what we want. Maybe it's so simple. You want candy from the candy store. It's 10 cents, yet you didn't have that dime. And you just tell your friend, hey, can you get this candy and just take it, put it in your pocket? in such a way that the cameras don't notice you and just give it to me. I want that candy so bad. Or maybe, just maybe, you have this test coming up for school and you want to get an A so bad, but the test is so difficult and you had to cheat your way to get that A. Reiterating the questions. Have there been moments when you've covered up something thinking that you could get away from it? And have there been moments when you had a goal set in mind, but the only way to achieve that goal is to lie to get to it? Answering both questions, 
David had to do both things. To cover up Uriah's death in order to be with Bathsheba. He made sure that Uriah died in the war so that David could get what he wanted. But in the end, God saw everything that was going on. Not only physically, but he saw what was going on in David's heart. And God was not pleased. One lie led to the next. And as sin represents us displeasing God, sin is the equivalent of committing a crime or an illegal activity. Imagine this. You murdered a loved one, physically killing someone you love. And you, you as the murderer, appeared before a judge for the sin that you've committed. Maybe you stole something valuable from someone and you get called out by it. You steal money from your parents thinking that you could get away from it. But let's say that one day your parents look in the wallet, finds, that missing, finds out that that missing bill was missing to the point where they ask you question after question. Or maybe you haven't attended a church virtually to the point where someone, for some odd reason, finds out. And they ask you what's going on. And it comes to the point where you make excuse after excuse. Let's say you're busy with homework, busy with work, or busy with God knows what. The moral that I'm trying to say with all of this is this. When people commit a sin, when they know that it is a sin, they live in a state of fear as they tend to always look over the shoulder and never find any peace. But why? People feel that if they get exposed, even if it's the slightest bit, they get extremely severely punished. For example, your parents find out that you stole that candy from the candy store and you get severely punished for that action. Or you get so negative rage over a simple video game and someone calls you out for that action. Going back to the very beginning of time, Adam and Eve, they were given one simple command from God to not eat from that tree in the middle. But the servant, sorry, the serpent, not the servant, conceived them to do so. They took the fruit, they ate the fruit, and they felt exposed. There's so many things that we feel exposed of negatively because of stuff that we've done wrong, either from the past, present, or even the now. But if there's one main point one main point I want to drive home it is this. It is that God's love is far superior than any sin that we have ever committed. All we need to do is to come with Him. Come to Him with open arms. But you may ask this question. How can I feel assured that God still loves me for who I am, even if I messed up? Let's go back to David for a second. He was supposed to lead his army, his, to lead his team into victory. But what happens? He looks at the other eye to a beautiful woman bathing at the rooftop to the point where he plotted step after step so that he could be with her. At the end of the day, what he did his actions, even though he got what he wanted, it displeased God. And it came to the point where David said this in Psalm, chapter, Psalm 32. Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the one whose sin the Lord does not count against them. 
and whose spirit is now deceived. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in the heat of the summer. And I acknowledged my sin to you. It did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord. And he forgave the guilt of my sin. The reality is this, that our God is a God who forgives, no matter what sin we have committed. And in verse 3 of this psalm, David expresses that he kept silent due to living in a sin that he was living that was unconfessed. In 2 Samuel 11, David has his eye on Bathsheba. He lusted out for her. He had her eye on her. He had his mind on her. And he wanted Uriah, her husband, to be killed in the war, just to be with her. Each sin kept leading to the next. And eventually, he had to come clean to God, saying simply, God, I messed up. I know I've done wrong to you but may forgive me of my sin. Now relating it to us, we are not perfect. We are not perfect individuals and we will never be perfect as we're messed up sinful people. We commit sin after sin against God, against the people we know day after day. And sometimes, even if it's hard, we don't want to admit those sins. Imagine you've done something wrong to a friend, a parent, or a stranger, and you don't want that wrongdoing to get exposed. The same thing applies with our relationship with God. Because of us being humanly exposed to the wrongs that we've done, whether it's big or small, we're afraid of saying the three simple words, I've messed up. Think of the prodigal son. The young son ran away from home because of something didn't go his own way. The young son, he partied his ways just to get what he wanted. And he hoped that what he had would satisfy him. But in the end, he hit rock bottom. He lost everything that he had. And the only thing that he could do is to go back to square one. Now with the mistakes that he made from running away from home, that young son, he contemplated whether or not it's even worth it to go back to his home. Now, the young son, down in the dumps, walking towards home with his head down in the dirt. And his father, still at the door, with his arms open wide, said, welcome home, my son. I still love you for who you are. Don't worry about what you've done. It's already been taken care of. I say all of this to say this. We may be living right now with sins that are unconfessed. Something that may be haunting us to this very day. Maybe you've, I say again, killed someone unintentionally. And that sin is haunting the back of your mind. Maybe you stole something and it keeps coming back to you day after day. Maybe you lied to somebody and that lie keeps haunting you to the point where you can't take it anymore. For David, it was sleeping with a woman that was not someone that he was married to. Maybe for us, it's a fractured relationship, stealing something that should not have been stolen in the first place, telling a lie that should not have been a lie in the first place. 
Psalm 32, 4 says, For day and night your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped in the heat of the summer. God was nudging David to come back to him so that his sins would be forgiven. Even though David had this sin, had this thing that he'd done, just kept haunting him day after day, God told him, just come to me. It's going to be okay. Don't worry about the thing that you've done. If we come clean to God, in spite of what we've done in the past, present, or future, he says, it is okay. Your sins are forgiven. It is done. Now, it is expected, if we've done something wrong, for someone to be mad or frustrated or sad. But the reason for that is that they still care for you. They still love you just for who you are. Has there been something that you've done wrong, either to God or to others, to the point where it was unnoticed, but in the end, it keeps haunting you day after day after day, to the point where you need to get that thing exposed out to the public. Imagine a murderer. He or she gets sentenced due to their crime. Because of man's law, it adds pressure to that someone because of that crime that they've committed. However, with God's law, his love for us is unexplainable and undeniable. In spite of the wrongs that we've done, God still loves us just for who we are. All we need to do as individuals is to come to him. There are going to be many moments in life when we are going to sin against God and sin against other people. But the reality is, is that we cannot hold those sins against us. We can't just hide them forever because one day, whether we like it or not, the sins that we have committed, it's going to get exposed to the public. But it's better to expose them sooner rather than later. You may ask this question, though, with all of that being said this afternoon, how, how can we expose our sin, especially when it feels uncomfortable? I've done this in the past. I've done that in the past. I may be doing something right now to the point where it's so uncomfortable to expose it to someone in the public. How can I be, how can I expose such thing if it feels uncomfortable? If there's one practicality that I hope each of us would take this afternoon, in spite of the toxicity that we're living in this world right now, with the sins that we've committed, in the past, in the present, and in the future. If there's one simple practicality I hope each of us takes home this afternoon, is to be vulnerable. Be vulnerable for who you are. The easier it will be for us to be vulnerable is just to be real with who we are. Don't try to hide anything, but just express yourself to the point where people will accept us because of God's love. I've said this verse in the beginning, and I'm going to say this verse again. In Romans 3.23, Apostle Paul, he makes it clear that all have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. We're all messed up individuals, and we're not perfect, and we will never be perfect. But the Bible says this, in 1 John 4, starting at verse 9, that this is how God showed his love for us. He sent his one and only Son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we've loved God, but he loved us. And he sent his Son 
as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. God's love for us is so unexplainable. It's so undeniable. God sent Jesus as the perfect sacrifice so that he could die for the sins that we've committed, past, present, and future. And with the love that God expressed to us, we must do the same to one another. We must care for one another. We must support one another. And even, I may add, to expose one another so that we can build each other up. And to close it out, I want to ask a few questions. Have you experienced God's love before? If so, what is his love to you? Maybe you're listening this afternoon and you haven't experienced the love of God before. And to experience him is simple. It's just to come to him with open arms. It's to accept him as Lord and Savior and to experience his love by reading his word and to apply his word day after day. Have there been moments when you felt guilt because of certain things that you've done in the past? You've killed somebody. You lied to somebody. You stole this from somebody to the point where they keep haunting you from it. It's okay because God's love is far superior than anything that's going on in this world. And what can we take from this message this afternoon that will encourage us to expose the toxicity that's in our lives? And that is two things. First is to be vulnerable. Be vulnerable to one another with what's going on. And secondly, and most importantly, is to express God's love first to ourselves and to one another. We must express love to every individual around us, not certain individuals. Because the Bible says this in 1 Peter 4.8, that love covers a multitude of sins. And Proverbs 10.12 says that hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. Some people think that one person's love can blot out another person's sin. The only love that can cover the sins is the love of Jesus Christ. His love led to the cross as he shed his blood for one of us. All of us, he shed his blood for us so that the sins that we've committed in the past, present, and future can be forgiven. Imagine the greatest sin that someone's ever committed. And it's been expressed in the news. It's expressed on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, social media, you name it, it's expressed and then it's exposed. We may feel exposed with the sins, the actions we, may we have committed, but because of God's love, it is okay. The thing that we need to do as the church is to be vulnerable with one another and to love one another. And if there's one final verse that I want to close out with, the greatest command that Jesus has expressed is from Mark 12, 30 and 31. As the Bible says this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is like it, to love your neighbor as yourself. And there's no greater commandment than this. There are so many things that is toxic in this world. There are so many things that we need to be exposed of, but it may feel hard to be exposed in the first place. Take one step at a time and it'll be okay because God's love is far much greater and superior than anything we've ever 
experienced and committed in this world? Are we vulnerable to one another? Are we expressing God's love to one another? And are we experiencing God's love for ourselves on a daily basis? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you so much for your word this afternoon. And as there's so much toxicity in this world right now, as we have sinned against you in your presence day after day, moment after moment, I pray right now that not only you forgive us for the sins that we've committed, but we would be vulnerable to expose what we've done, not only to you, God, but to our loved ones, to the people around us, so that at the end of the day, we can continue to not only express your love to one another, but for your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. We thank you so much for the word that you've given to us this afternoon. And I pray that whatever we've learned from your word, that we would just apply it into our lives and to continue to express your love to this broken world, God. Because it is only you that is important. We love you and we thank you for what you've done and what you're going to continue to do. And I pray everything in your precious and your holy name. Amen.